Good morning, everybody. My name is Marnielle Voss, and I worked for the state. I thank you very much. You were so kind for 23 years, but I worked for another company before that for more than 20 plus years. So I do have lots of gray hair myself. So anyway, thank you all for being here. Now, I know we had a show of hands in the very beginning for all those people that worked on a project. So I'd like those people to raise their hand again. And then I want you to keep it raised if you worked on a project and it was, you worked with your stakeholders and you worked with your procurement people and your department and you worked with those people that helped you with the project management portion of it and IV and V and so I, we should start seeing some hands. We've got a few that have remained up. Thank you very much. I just really wanted to get a breadth or depth of how many people have been through the rigors and the whole process. And I think um, Francisco did a great job in um, speaking to how rigorous the process is to actually implement a solution um, for one of our programs within our department. Some are very small, some are very large. We're working on the, one of the ones that um, we're working on currently is the child welfare system. And it's huge, it's huge. And we've got federal government matching funds, so they're a stakeholder also. But it's really important as you start down and look at the process that really you plan for all of the different parts and pieces ahead of time, but always know that you're going to have lots of risks identified through the process and areas that you'll be able to mitigate during the process. Nothing's ever going to be perfect in a project. I've worked on more than I care to remember and not one of them has been perfect. Many of them have been very successful. Some of them have not. But you always have points to regroup. But it's really important for us to try to set ourselves up for success. Yeah. So you notice that I'm with procurement, so we don't have any pretty colored fancy charts. We just have words, right? Because isn't that what a procurement document looks like? It's just a bunch of words. But those words are really important. And how we communicate to not just our stakeholders, but the supplier community is very important. Many projects and many people, when they're starting off, they're, they're going through this Herculean effort to plan and to get budget money and to look at your business requirements and to work with your program. And all you really want is the shiny, blingy thing that comes at the end, right? And that's a contract for a solution. But what you need to remember is that blingy thing that comes at the end is really the beginning. Okay, so it takes you through, you're going through one phase and you get your solution and you start on a whole nother phase. So we're going to discuss a little bit about the procurement process because there's lots of ins and outs and I want you to always need me because I really need a job. My, my, uh, we have horses. I don't know if any of you are familiar with horses. They cost a lot of money so I'll be working the rest of my life. So <laughs> there's always places that you can go for help. So you ha how many people know the people in their contract office? Perfect. That's always good to know the people in your contract not office. Now, not all the time will those people in your contract office be helping you on a large project, but they will help you um, in many instances providing uh, ancillary or what we're going to call ancillary kinds of services. So if you need a project manager to help you, if you need um, a consultant to come in and help you with your governance or your risk management or you need somebody that can help with um, change management right because one of the things that happens when you 
have these large um, projects is there's a lot of change that has to happen, not just within ourselves and our, and our desktop, but within the organization. So it's very important, and a lot of your contract people will be able to help you with that. So as Francisco spoke to the stage two area, which was that diagram that um, had market research, business analysis, setting your team, setting your goals and objectives, all of those areas are when you actually start planning to do a buy for a solution. So there's lots of different ways about purchasing. So if we're looking at when an IT reportable project, which is what Francisco was talking about and what um, we're involved in at CDT in the um, statewide technology procurement area, we're involved in IT reportable projects. Our partners, the Department of General Services in the procurement division arena, are responsible for providing lots of um, leverage type agreements or lots of standard agreements that we can go out and purchase things off of to meet our day-to-day -day business needs. Or when we talk about ancillary services, maybe picking up somebody to do, help us with change management or help us with our project planning or, or help us with um, a, um, writing an RFP or some other kind of document. Those are, we can um, look towards the Department of General Services in many instances for those kinds of what I call or we call leveraged agreements. So there's standard agreements. You can go out and very easily do a request for offer, which is a, okay, all the terms and conditions, everything are set up. I'm just going to go out and do a request for office, offer. Your large IT projects will have many, what, what I call ancillary supporting solicitations. And again, for any large IT reportable project, we know you're going to have at least a few. One of those, because it's required, will be for independent verification and validation um, consultant, right? So an IBNV consultant. Another one might be to help you actually write whatever kind of solicitation you're going to be using. Another one might be to help you with um, uh, some services that you might need, which again, OCM. I, I bring OCM in because I don't think we do enough on change management when we're looking at these full-blown um, IT projects that are going to change the way we do business. So it's really important for all of our staff and people that there's an effect on that we actually help them know what that effect will be and how to work in this new environment. In addition, you're going to need oversight, right? That's a requirement. And that comes from the Department of Technology in the oversight area, which will help you not only just with the planning that Francisco spoke about, but then throughout the implementation. I, from a procurement perspective, and I'm involved in planning and all that, but I truly believe that I can, we can buy the best product in the world. We can have a great supplier. I can have bonds to protect you from here to the, to the heavens. If we don't implement properly, you will not be successful. So all the planning that we do in the beginning continues through implementation. And you actually have a project that is reportable until it's finished. And then we call that peered. When it's absolutely met its success points and it's completed, then it's a peered project that becomes just part of your everyday business workings. You need to understand who can help you. None of us are a success without each other. And that's never more true than in an IT reportable project. You want your contract people, your program, as, as Francisco said, your stakeholders, your budget office within your department. 
you need a contract manager, not just to approve invoices, but to actually help manage the contract and the different work efforts. I wanted to spend a moment with you because I'm sure that you have never been overwhelmed by all of these names, right? We have lots and lots of tools in our tool chest. Sometimes it's, it's hard to know which tool to pull out. So I wanted to provide you a list and ask all of you, how, how many of you are familiar with some of these tools? See, Matt, oh good, that's good. So many of these tools are set up for a smaller, less risky purchase that actually will help you with a larger purchase, right? So if I need to hire an IV and V supplier to help me with my planning, uh, not help me with my planning, but to oversee my planning and the efforts through the project, I would go to probably the Master Service Agreement or the ITMSA. <laughs> and I would do a request for offer off of that. And basically your request for offer is a statement of work. A statement of work that includes deliverables, how you're, how you're gonna pay the supplier, because that's really important. But what's so nice about these leveraged agreements is that you don't have to worry about the terms and conditions. The suppliers have already agreed to them. So there's standard state terms and conditions, which means there's less risk, which means you don't have to have a huge mitigation plan to help you managing that contract. So your IVNV or your RFP writer or your change management consultant already know what the requirements are and what the terms and conditions are around their contract. So those are leveraged agreements and there's several kinds. If I want to buy software, and especially now with the cloud and, and things, we're getting more and more um, what we call SLPs or software licensing um, purchasing agreements. If I want to uh, use a master or the California Multiple Award Schedule or CMAS. Now CMAS, the reason we have many instances, so many different selections for you, is CMAS is actually created off of the federal GSA. It is not a bid contract. It was assessed, which means that the federal government looked at the pricing, compared it to other suppliers' pricing that provides the same type service, and looked at that and said, okay, this is in within a fair and reasonable amount of dollars so we're going to allow that to be, and they call it a Schedule 70, which is where they actually put out all of the SKU numbers and the highest rates that the federal government will, can um, pay. Then we take those federal GSA schedules and we put our California terms and conditions around them because we have some additional law that the Fed, federal government doesn't have, I know that's amazing, but we do in California have some additional law that the federal government does not have. So we put those terms and conditions in addition around the federal GSAs and we call them CMASs, California Multiple Award Schedules. They have a lower dollar amount that you can spend, usually in IT services, um, it's about 500,000. And that's just because they're competitively assessed rather than bid. So your MSA, your Master Services Agreements, will go up some instances, well they go up to 1.5 million if you have delegation. How many of you know if you have delegation or not from the Department of General Services? Okay, so that's a really important thing to know. And, um, your contract people in your office will know or your admin area will know. If not, you can look at the Department of General Services website and they have each department and what their delegation amount is, okay? If you have any level of delegation, so even 
$10,000 or $100,000 of delegation, you, will let, you are allowed to use these kinds of agreements within your department, which is very, very nice. It helps a lot because usually there's, um, again, all the terms and conditions, pricing, all you're doing is putting in your statement of work, you've always got to do your statement of work, how you plan on paying the supplier, whether that's on deliverables, progress payments, whether it's going to be a one time at the end, all of those areas. And then you put it out um, on the street, and I think it's a, you know, it's actually out there for, I think it depends on the agreement, five to ten days. Could be longer if you need it to be. Um, and then you can make an award based on however you're going to evaluate. So it's a very quick and easy method to be able to purchase. Um, the statewide contracts, some of them are mandatory, which means that the state has decided to go out and say to the supplier community, we're going to buy this product from you and we need the best price you can give us, right? So it's almost like a sourcing kind of thing. We're gonna guarantee you that we're gonna buy, anybody that's buying this product, we're gonna buy it from you or a group of you. And so we need to get a really good price for it. So those are your statewide agreements. Then there's informal competition. My favorite is informal competition because it's really, um, you get in, you write your statement of work, you put it out there, and you get to award. But it's for lower dollar levels, right? This is where your small business, disabled veteran business enterprise option comes into play, up to 250000 Really important because, you know, if we don't meet our small business goals or our DVBE goals at the end of the year, we get to write a report to the legislature, right? None of us want to have to do that. So it's really important, and whenever you can, um, to look towards your small business and DVBE option within your uh, purchasing for the state. Then we get into what we call formal, and those are for the really large buys. And it is a formal process where we've developed in stage two business requirements at a kind of a medium level, Give us an idea of what your business requirements are. Now you're going to move them into very much a technical level for functional and non-functional requirements. We're going to put them in a document. You're going to have um, possibly some inter integration points, some interface points, all of those things that you need from a supplier for your IT reportable project and, and your solution. You're going to be uh, developing that. And this is when... Um, um, people of the faint of heart get a little nervous when, I, when we talk about an RFP or an IFB because it is quite a bit of work. The nice thing about it is at the end, if you do it right, you actually have your road map of how you're going to pay, what you're going to pay on, and what the consequences are if the supplier doesn't deliver. Right? So you've got a wonderful road map if it's done appropriately and we follow the contract. The other thing we are, are doing now, too, is we're taking, in some instances, very large monolithic type projects that were just, you know, 2,000 requirements and would take four or five years to um, implement, and we're breaking them up into modules, and then we're able to use, you know, these create some supplier pools or use some um, RFOs that are less, um, a less tedious process as to, as, um, and allow us to be able to change more quickly than you can when you've, when you've got um, a huge uh, monolithic type project going on and uh, a project plan that was developed five years ago and we're still going through the paces, right? But you should, eat, no matter what um, vehicle you use, you should always keep the contract updated. So many of you probably do not have, you have contract people, but they do your buying for you. A lot of departments don't have a contract management area or a contract manager. Your contract manager will be your best friend if you're a project manager throughout the life of the project. Um, 
it's very important to keep those documents alive, your contract alive with your amendments, and to continue uh, making sure that everyone's following the roadmap, right? And that we're getting our, um, our uh, maps updated as they need to be updated. When, the new, when a new road appears, the map doesn't automatically in our GPS system get updated, does it? I have to take it to the dealership or, or buy the disc to update our maps. And you should keep your contract updated all along the path. We also have those things that no one wants to talk about, NCBs, non-competitive bids, but sometimes there's a reason for them. Sometimes it's in the contract amendment stage where you know you, you, you still need to work with this supplier. You haven't quite finished this yet, so you've got to do a non-competitive bid to, do, to be able to implement an amendment. I actually think they're necessary in many instances, but I realize people get all worried about them. We also have another tool in our toolbox called 6611 or negotiations where um, the procurement division, whether that be within Department of General Services or the state technology area for, CD, for um, California Department of Technology, um, we are allowed to work with you to help you negotiate. So sometimes we have to negotiate a an amendment into a, in a contract where we've maybe gone off and now we've got to get everybody back to a new baseline so we'll negotiate. Sometimes we're negotiating because there was new legislation and now we have some additional, um, um, some additional to-dos that must be done, right? So every time there's new legislation, a lot of times they may not give you very much funding for it, but they certainly want you to implement it within the year. So in many instances, those are the reasons to go into negotiations. And then I, no matter what, I always have to put that last little bit in there. Contract management needs to be planned for in the development of the solicitation. Your contract manager needs to come on board and be a part of your team so they know everything that's going on and can help you manage that contract. And you manage your contract not just through change orders and change requests, okay? Contract amendments are just as important as change orders and change requests to keep that alive. Here we go, yes. So what's the most important during the solicitation development? Okay, requirements, how you're gonna pay. The supplier always know, wants to know how you're gonna pay. Okay, so that's very important. Time frame, who are your stakeholders? Realistic time frames. You guys are always gonna want the procurement done in a nanosecond compared to the rest of the project. I guarantee you that wherever I get involved, everybody wants the procurement done in, in two months or a month. And it is a process, and we've got to have enough time to ensure that the supplier community has the ability to ask questions, can t absolutely understands what our business needs are, and that we've got a good procurement document so that we get a good contract. So, and we need a realistic time frame, and a lot of that goes by the size, but not always. Sometimes smaller projects are just as um, intense as large ones. The statement of work with the deliverables is a key part, and that's on the department to, to develop that. And we will help you, and we also have um, a website that, on our website, the CDT website, we have how to develop a good statement of work guidelines, how to do market research guidelines. So there's, we're, we're providing lots of tools for you. You just, you need to reach out and then we will come over and discuss those with you or help you with those as we can. So your key, the other key is your requirements, right? You need well-defined requirements for your functional and non-functional business needs and then your stakeholders, your core team members, as, as Francisco was saying, are crucial, along with your knight, whether that be a woman or a man, with the flag on the white steed, right, that's gonna clear the path for us to be successful. Everyone needs that knight in their office, a champion to help them clear the path. 
and that will more than anything else help you move towards success. We are always here, Department of General Services, Procurement Division, and um, CDT, um, Statewide Technology Procurement, are always here to help you with, those, with the planning and how to do uh, the work of a good contract, create a good contract. So thank you very much.